is being recorded. Our speaker for this session is Professor Steve Skirlos from the University of Michigan. Uh, Steve Skirlos is an Arthur F. Uh, now Professor of Mechanical Engineering and Civil and Environmental Engineering. He received his PhD in Industrial Engineering in 2000 and his BSc in Electrical Engineering with highest honors in 1994, both from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. He has been a faculty member at the University of Michigan since 2000. Professor Skrillos is known as a scholar in the field of sustainable design, focusing on technology policy and product design, manufacturing, and utility infrastructure. Professor Skrillos is chief technology officer of Fusion Coolant Systems, a company that has developed gas-based coolants and lubricants for manufacturing. Professor Skrillos was a uh, faculty inventor and founder of Akiri Cytometers, now part of BD, which was acquired for $205 million in 2011. Professor Skrilos is the Director of Sustainability Education Programs in the College of Engineering, Director of the Program in Sustainable Engineering, and is the Faculty Director for the UM Center for Socially Engaged Design. He serves on the Executive Committee of the UM Graham Sustainability Institute. In addition to technology innovations, his research has yielded significant implications for policy, such as warning early on that increases to corporate average fuel economy standards would not stem the trend towards larger vehicles, and more recently establishing climate action timeframes within specific industrial sectors. Thank you so much for coming and sharing your knowledge with us, Professor Skrilos. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. Um... And, and thanks for, uh, you know, we've, we've got about 15 uh, attendees and, um, you know, taking time on, on a Saturday to think about, you know, uh, the, the long term issue that that is climate change. Um, you know, as I prepared for uh, today, you know, I definitely wanted to think about an approach that might have value uh, you know, more than just talking about the work that uh, I've done in the past um, and really try to provide a way of thinking about sustainability and then apply it to a topic that I, that I know very well. Uh, so what we're going to do today is we're going to, I hope, give an honest evaluation of a technology, a specific technology um, which is the use of recycled carbon dioxide as what's known as a cutting fluid. So that, that's going to be our case study. Uh, but what we're going to do is apply a set of what I call necessary conditions for sustainability to this case. Um, you know, as everyone knows, um, you know, everybody will claim their product is green uh, their process is green. Their lifestyle is green. Um, you know, it's it's all good for the environment. It's all sustainable. But of course, in aggregate, it isn't. So how can we evaluate technology systems to understand whether they may contribute in a positive way or possibly a negative way to sustainability? So I'm going to provide that framework, that necessary conditions framework, uh, for evaluating technology systems to basically help us tell whether something is greenwashing or not. And rather than just talk about that in, in general, we'll apply it to this technology uh, that, that I invented um, uh, about 15 years ago and is now a Michigan company. And uh, you are uh, welcome to come up with your own judgment as to whether this has the potential to contribute positively to sustainability or whether it's greenwashing. Greenwashing being the idea that you know, we call it sustainable and we give it a sustainability narrative, but really it's not good for the planet. So um, we have, I think, the ability for you all to ask questions. Um, and, and I have a screen up here. Uh, feel free to ask questions on, uh, on, on Zoom. Uh, I assume that's open to you. Um, and as I see questions uh, pop up, I'll try to fold them in. And of course, I'll leave time for questions 
at the end. So uh, let's start with the idea of a, of a cutting fluid. Uh, what we see here is a, uh, a drill. Uh, you might be familiar with, uh, you know, making a hole. Uh, you may have been in a, in a woodworking class and you had to drill some holes or you, you did some projects around uh, the house. Um, and you may be familiar with a hand drill. Uh, this is a computer control drill, um, but it's the same idea. And at the beginning of the video, you could see this sort of twist drill, right? And you see this fluid coming out of it. And, and modern manufacturing would not be possible without the fluid that is coming through the drill. Now, it's not cutting wood. You can cut wood without um, what are called cutting fluids. Um, but when you cut metal, if it's steel, if it's aluminum, if it's um, a titanium you know, for aircraft, um, you, you pretty much need these fluids. Um, without these fluids, you know, this drill that we're looking at, um, which may cost $200, $300, is, is not going to last very long. In addition, you, you want to cut metal fast because you want to make product as quickly as you can. Well, without the fluids, you can't cut fast. So you will not be competitive because your tools will cost too much, you'll, you'll waste time changing tools, you're buying tools, you're not making product fast enough unless these cutting fluids are around. And people have tried to cut metal without these fluids, but it turns out um, nobody's really found a good way to do it. So these cutting fluids are, are necessary, but you can tell they're messy. Um, they, they look like milk, they're basically milk. You know, if you think about it, you know, you have water in these fluids to cool, but you also have oil in these fluids to lubricate. So the lubrication um, reduces friction, that reduces heat generation, it allows the, the, the tool to move faster, but there will always be heat. So you need the water there to remove the heat, right? So oil to minimize heat, but what heat there is gets removed with water. Now, if there's one thing everybody knows, it's that oil and water do not mix. So to get them to mix, at least for a little while, there's a lasagna of chemicals that um, are used to semi-stabilize the oil in the water. And, um, you know, if you think about milk, because I think milk is a good analogy for this, uh, bacteria grow in milk, right? Um, and bacteria grow in these fluids too. One milliliter of these fluids may have a billion or a trillion bacteria in it. And, you know, those bacteria are living by eating the fluid <laughs> And, and therefore, the fluid's going to destabilize. And even if you control the bacteria, you're, you're going to put formaldehyde or other um, biostabilizing ingredients to this fluid, it will still destabilize because oil is inherently unstable in water. So there's a whole like PhD to be had in studying cutting fluid chemistry, which I did for five years in the late 90s, studying these fluids, formulating these fluids, trying to make these fluids more biostable, trying to make these fluids recyclable, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So let me summarize. Uh, metalworking fluids are ubiquitous. They're, they're used, we use more than 2 billion gallons a year um, in concentrate form. So then we add water to it and you know, now you got 20, 10, 20, billion gallons of fluid that has to be produced, has to be um, disposed of, has to be maintained. Uh, they are not cheap. Uh, they are about a dollar a gallon to buy, a dollar a gallon to use, and a dollar a gallon to dispose. Um, and, and I was just at a, at a talk yesterday where you know, half of, the, at least there's some research out there that shows about half of metals manufacturing energy goes to these fluid systems on a life cycle basis. So um, big energy footprint, 
Um, they're expensive. Um, you know, they, you know, you think of that $200 drill, you know, the fluids actually cost more than, than the tools. So, you know, we've got a cost issue here. We have a human health issue here because workers that are exposed to these fluids are more likely to have many, many cancers than you know the, the general population. And on average, a machinist exposed to cutting fluid over a lifetime is gonna have a lower lifespan than the general population. So these are harmful to workers and bad for the environment, right? I talked about the energy footprint, but there's also this lasagna of chemicals that ultimately end up in a wastewater treatment plant and, you know, back in the river, you know, the Kalamazoo River, the Huron River, you know, um, you know, the, 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 these fluids are not perfectly clean before they are put back into the environment. So it's a big waste of clean water and it's also a polluter of freshwater systems. So there's a trifecta here of issues. There are cost issues, health issues, environmental issues, right? So to, to sum it up, you know, these fluids, they're essential for modern manufacturing. They're expensive. They're not stable. They're hazardous. They're polluting. And we've been doing this for like 70 years, pretty much since World War II, we've been doing it this way. So, um, you know, I wasn't turned on to sustainability when I was a high school student like you folks. It took me a few more years. I was a, a junior in uh, college when I was turned on to the issue. So this was, um, you know, 1993. Um, you know, I was beginning to learn about, you know, with the climate scientists like James Hansen were, were talking about in the late 80s when I was in high school. And um, yeah, I wanted to make a career of pollution prevention. And I was given the opportunity to work on this problem um, when I was a, uh, pretty much a senior in college. So a few years older than, than many of you folks. And I set about the, the, you know, to the question, you know, what would be a sustainable cutting fluid? What would it look like? And I made this diagram and you know, it, it still works you know, 25 years later or whatever it is. Um, you know, if you want a more sustainable cutting fluid, then you're going to need to reduce environmental emissions, the, the energy footprint, the carbon footprint, um, the chemical emissions, the health and safety risks to workers. And you got to make whatever solution you have that improves the environment and improves worker health. You got to give people a reason to buy it. So either it's going to be cheaper, it's going to be better, it's going to be faster, it's going to lead to higher quality, right? So that's where this three-dimensional figure um, really comes from, right? Um, you really um, uh, need to work in all three dimensions at the same time. So as, uh, you know, as, as it was mentioned in the beginning, I'm a professor at the University of Michigan. I find a lot of students are really eager to design sustainable products. And you know, what they don't realize right away is it's harder than designing products because you still got to design stuff people want, but you need to have this deep knowledge of the customer, what they need, and protect the environment and worker health at the same time. And it, it, it takes a lot of stubborn patience and you know a decade to do that. So this is the model to improve sustainability. There is another model for it um, because uh, you know, I've learned, I've, I've started now three companies and I've realized to sort of transform that model we just looked, like, looked at into something that might work for a startup company you need to, um, you know, maybe think of it maybe more this way. So sustainability is an enterprise, not just a concept. And in this model, we have uh, consumers and the government, because um, the government's a big purchaser, but the government's also a big regulator, right? And regulation can drive a lot of uh, adoption of sustainable products. So in a lot of ways, consumers and government are similar, right? There's also industry, right, that thinks of these solutions. But really what we're trying to serve is over here, society, um, health, 
environment over here. And often it's external, right? We don't capture when you just go click on something to buy it at Amazon, like the, the impact that may be very negative. It could be child labor uh, in some faraway country. It could be pollution in the US or abroad, right? Or climate change doesn't really matter where you pollute, right? It affects us all. Um, you know, we call that an externality to what the uh, company may actually, you know, have in their sort of narrow focus to make a profit, right? So to, to boil this down, you've got companies that can provide ideas, products, and services. You've got consumers in the government that have a certain willingness to uh, pay, but also in the government side, the ability, ability to regulate. And between industry and let's call it demand, right? Supply and demand is today's market, profit motive, right? But as we think about sustainability, we gotta think about society and the planet and try to address at the same time these external environmental, social, public health needs, right? So there's a sweet spot here that, you know, we need new business models, we need new technology that is profitable in today's market, right? That's really what sustainable design is, right? It's, it's bringing the externalities together with the profit motive and demand and finding that sweet spot, okay? So that's what we need to do. That's the target, right? That's, a, that's the target for a sustainable enterprise. So let's come back to cutting fluids now and express an idea, okay? Um, and, you know, I, I kind of have a top and bottom here. This is a, uh, a, an implant, okay, a hip. So, you know, you might have an elderly relative who needs a new hip or maybe a new knee or a shoulder, right? Those are metal products, okay, biomedical products. And I have this kind of facetious, um, you know, question at the top here. You know, which hip would you rather have? The one being made at the top or the one being made at the bottom? The one at the top is being made with a conventional uh, cutting fluid, okay? This emulsion milk stuff. And obviously, you know, there's the potential for bacteria to be in there, it needs to be cleaned. Now, what I didn't mention is that hip, this hip cup you see here in the lower diagram, and the fact is you can see it because there isn't cutting fluid all over it. Um, it is actually porous. So your body can kind of grow into it, okay? Now, you know, imagine putting this emulsion milk into a hip that, you know, is porous, right? How are you ever going to clean it, right? And, you know, 3D printed hip cups, a great thing because, you know, your body can grow into it, right? Um, and, and, you know, for hip cups that are not 3D printed, they got to go through a lot of surface shenanigans to get your body to not reject it. And in fact, there have been cases where the cutting fluid on conventional hip cups hasn't been cleaned enough, or let's say biomedical implants, hasn't been cleaned enough, and the human body rejects it. And there's been lawsuits, right? So, you know, there's a market potentially for a cleaner cutting fluid, especially for these biomedical products um, that potentially now, maybe you don't have to clean them as much or maybe you don't have to clean it at all. You know, in this bottom example, um, the part is actually coming off the machine cleaner than it went on. Uh, so, um, you know, and this was an invention. So this was an idea that I had um, maybe 15 years ago as a professor at the University of Michigan. I had spent maybe 10 years of my life trying to make the emulsion, a better cutting fluid. And finally, I realized like, you know, yeah, there are things we can do to make it better, but it's still really bad, you know? So I started looking for better ideas and this idea to reuse carbon dioxide, 
reuse it instead of sending it to the atmosphere or let's put it in a truck, let's um, bring it to a manufacturing facility, let's use it as a cutting fluid. That was the idea. And people had tried ways of doing this before, um, but I added some secret sauce, which I'll get to later, that actually made this work because people had been trying carbon dioxide as a cutting fluid for a long time, uh, but you know, we got it to work. And you know this is a very clean process. And it turns out it's a no compromise process because you can make your hip cups faster. You don't have to clean them. There's no water pollution. Like every problem I brought up before um, pretty much goes away, right? We can make them faster. The tools last longer. So the life cycle energy goes down. It seems like a really good idea, right? It seems like something, you know, I can sell you, right? But be careful, right? When anybody tries to sell you something, right? Especially over the internet, right? So let's get rigorous about this, right? So I, I took this slide that my company uses, like it's a cleaner, safer solution, right? It eliminates water pollution. It reduces carbon footprint over the life cycle, eliminates these health risks, not just the cancer stuff, but other stuff I didn't even mention. Um, you can recycle your metal shavings and get more money for that because they're not polluted with cutting fluid. Isn't this great, right? And I put the question mark there, right? Because sure, I could have come to you on a Saturday morning and bragged about this stuff and this company and blah, 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 and who's using it and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, as, you know, somebody at least who tried to be honest, you know, and who knows if, you know, everybody, it's, it's difficult to really know if you're being honest, right? It's up to somebody else. Um, you know, I, I want to put the question mark here and ask you to think critically. Is this a bill of goods? Right. And, and how would I even know? Right. And, and my job as a professor, you know, I do a lot of stuff that aren't cutting fluids and I, and I teach classes right on the sustainable design of cutting fluids. I'm going to teach a class in the fall called sustainable campus design. We're going to work on the University of Michigan itself and, and try to work on projects that actually help move it toward a carbon neutral future. Um, you know, I run the program in sustainable engineering like we need to talk in an honest way not in a greenwashing way about products, right? Is there such thing as a sustainable product, right? Let's ask the question, all right? And, you know, I believe in, in some work that I did maybe five or six years ago was really try to establish a set of criteria. And, and you know, I think that's the important thing for you is when somebody claims a sustainable technology, I want you to think about, okay, well, how do I really know if it's BS or not, right? So I want to like change gears out of cutting fluids for a sec, maybe a minute, maybe five minutes. And let's talk about criteria for a sustainable technology. Okay, so when we do that, then we got to ask the question, okay, what again is sustainability? Sustainability, we think of it as being about the planet, but really it's about people. Let's not kid ourselves. We do not protect the planet for the planet, right? As much as I wish we would, we don't. As a human species, we've taken it over. It's the Anthropocene and we use it for ourselves. And we think about the environment because of us, right? We want our you know, your generation, um, you know, my kids coming up behind you, their kids, your kids, you know, to have the same opportunity to access resources and natural capital the way we have, right? So it's a simple idea. It goes back to the Brundtland Commission back in the late 80s, meeting the needs of people today without sacrificing the ability of future generations to meet their needs. So it's a reminder, it's not about the environment, it's about people. It's about the environment for people. And I love nature as much as I'm sure you folks do. Um, and, and I wanna like, set aside nature. Humans haven't proven to be very good at that, not yet. Hopefully that changes. So when somebody talks to you about sustainability, when, when I'm called a, 
a professor of sustainability, I have to laugh a little bit, right? Because sustainability is a dirty little secret here. Sustainability isn't a thing. No such thing as sustainability. Sustainability is a catch-all. It's a catch-all for about 200 things, right? Complicated issues, each of those 200 things. Climate change, air resources, water resources, wealth distribution, justice, um, racism, economic development. It's all in sustainability. It's not just climate change. And we have to get good at prioritizing environmental issues among the social issues and figuring out, okay, when it comes to our cutting fluid, yes, is it carbon neutral? Is it better, you know, carbon negative? But does it protect the health of workers? Let's go back to the motivation I gave initially. Does it protect the health of workers? Does it protect water systems? Does it lead to new problems, right? We got to ask these questions across all the sustainability criteria. And that's where the necessary conditions for a sustainable technology come in. Okay, and it's a little complicated. There's a lot of words here, but it's actually a really easy idea. It's just common sense, right? So when I come to you and say, I got a sustainable cutting fluid based on carbon dioxide, look at my pictures, isn't this great? You should not only ask yourself, is he pulling one over on me? You should apply a sustainability filter. It's like you do on Instagram, right? Um, filter it down. What, is he, what does sustainability mean? What does sustainability mean? Well, using the Brundtland Commission definition, we can establish criteria for sustainable technologies. And the first one is, okay, forget sustainability. What problem are you actually solving? right? What unmet, I'm going to come back to this picture here, unmet social or environmental need are you trying to pull into the market or pull into regulation? What is it? And if you can't identify it, then get out of town, right? Are you trying to work on the health of workers? Are you trying to eliminate water pollution? Are you doing all those things? Are you trying to be carbon neutral at the same time? What are you trying to make progress on environmentally or socially? That's criteria one. And it's not only like, okay, I'm reducing carbon footprint, right? Let me give you an example. I turned off the lights when I came into my office today, right? I actually didn't turn them on. They they were already off, right? I can tell you that is sustainable office management. What a great guy I am, right? I didn't turn on my lights today. I saved carbon. Look how sustainable I am. Well, the first thing you should ask is, okay, well, you know, do you buy carbon offsets? Do you have solar panels on your house? You know, do you always, where's your thermostat right now, right? Are you reducing energy at a significant scale relative to your impact? Number one, you fly around on a private jet, number two, right? But, you know, I I mean, is this really sustainability? Is this really about helping future, future generations when you just don't turn your lights on? Get out of town. It's not at an appropriate scale for you to be saying in any way you're helping sustainability, right? It's good. Don't turn your lights on. Great. But that's common sense. In any way, it's saving you money right? So you should be doing that anyway, right? There's a mentality here. This is this kind of a BS filter, right? like number one, um, you know, are you doing something at scale here? Are you doing something meaningful? Is it actually helping people? Or is it just doing what, you know, you should be doing anyway? Business as usual, a little bit better. Okay. Now I can argue when I'm talking about my cutting fluids that I'm eliminating health hazards, I'm eliminating cancer, I'm eliminating water pollution, and I can probably convince you that I'm lowering carbon footprint. But I would argue, even if I wasn't, 
you know, I'm probably not increasing it very much. And maybe for the case of cutting fluids, that might not be the biggest issue anyway, right? Because where are cutting fluids in terms of the world's climate problems, right? I mean, it's transportation, it's heating the home and, and industry and cement and other forms of transportation and, uh, you know, servers that are running the internet, right? Electricity, of course. Um, there's a lot of stuff and cutting fluids may not actually be that significant. It doesn't mean like blow a hole in the carbon budget of cutting fluids, but maybe that's not the thing we should be really focused on here. Maybe it is. I don't know. We'll get there, right? But, you know, you got to start prioritizing, you know, what are the social issues and environmental issues that really matter here? And as you apply your solution that's actually doing something, are you making things worse, right? In the old days, 100 years ago, they had refrigerators based on explosive materials. And when those explosive materials were replaced with CFCs, it seemed like a really great thing because refrigerators weren't exploding anymore. Imagine that in your house, right? But it created a new problem, an ozone hole, a climate change problem, right? And they didn't know that at the time. Right, so when you create your solution, it can't be worse than the problem you were starting with, right? So that's criteria number two. You know, as you do something good in number one at scale, don't make things worse in another dimension that may be as important or more important, right? So this is this life cycle argument. We gotta look at the unintended consequences of our actions. As I make a carbon I'm sorry, as I make a cutting fluid that improves worker health, right? I don't want to destroy the planet or maybe use other toxic materials or, you know, kill things or whatever, right? Wreck ecosystems. I don't want, I have to think about that. And then I need to think about, okay, I've got a good solution. It's actually solving a real problem or at least making headway on a real problem. And, you know, this makes sense on a life cycle basis. I'm not making things worse. But the third criteria is the market needs to adopt it, right? Because there's nothing sustainable about products that people don't buy or don't adopt, right? So you got to think about the market again, going back to that figure, right? The market's got to adopt or, or at least some regulation around it. But good luck making regulations these days. I mean, we all know Washington doesn't work, right? So, um, you know, we got to think about how that solution is going to be adopted. And we also got to think about whether that solution is adopted so much that we're actually worse off. You know, I like to use the example of the flat screens, right? You know, you're probably watching a, on a tablet here or, you know, some flat screen device. And, you know, when I was, you know, in the 90s, younger, you know, it was a great solution to re replace the old picture tubes. You know, you've probably seen an old fashioned TV with these big picture tubes, cathode ray tubes. Those are terrible for the environment, right? So you replace it with a flat screen of the same size. That's good for the environment. But it turned out flat screens were bad for the environment because we learned how to manufacture them really cheaply and then we had them all over the place. And next thing you know, I mean, I'm just looking on my desk. I've got one, two, three, four, five, six um, flat panel displays just within eyesight here, right? That's worse for the planet. All right, so that's called the rebound effect. And that's criteria number four. All right, so we got to apply all these criteria. Let's go back to additive manufacturing. I want to pause. I'm going to take a 30 second pause. If you got a question, you can, th you can throw it in the, in the chat, but the pause is going to be this. All right, think about 3D printing, additive manufacturing, All right? Layer by layer manufacturing. I think you all know what 3D printers are. Sustainable or not? Here are the criteria. Take what you know about sustainability, these criteria and 3D printers and ask yourself, is additive manufacturing, 3D printing, the future a sustainable technology? Okay, I'm going to take a 30-second pause starting now. And if you have a question, throw it in the 
in the Zoom Q&A. Okay, So, and thank you for the question in the, um, uh, in the q and I'll get to that in just a few minutes. Um, and, and please add more. Uh, this is way more fun when, when we're answering your questions. You know, in regards to 3D printing, it was a trick question. Because you can use 3D printing to make great biomedical implants, and that's probably a sustainable solution for an aging society. But there's a bunch of other stuff, as you all know, you can do with 3D printers, right? So the answer to the question depends on what you're making. Are you making a 3D printed gun? Are you making a, a guitar? Are you making implants? What are you making? And the answer will change. So the context really matters. Right, and uh, so there's a really good question from an attendee here about whether condition four be included in condition two, and the answer is yes. So, you know, when we think about the unintended consequences, if we think about them, um, you know, really criteria two is about environmental and social unintended consequences in the life cycle. Criteria four is pointing out the economic dimension and the potential for economic um, uh, unintended consequences too. So it's a great point. You could, um, you know, the, the, there's a certain logic to saying, all right, well, you need to be successful in the market, but not too successful in the market economically. So we just separated this one out, right? So I, I think it's a great point. Absolutely. Uh, criteria number four is an unintended consequence. Okay. And, and I want to point out that the context really matters. There are sustainable uses of 3D printing. There are unsustainable uh, uses of 3D printing. So we're going to go back now and uh, get back into the cutting fluid discussion. And we'll get to uh, the question of how CO2 is used to replace a cutting fluid. You remember that drill I showed? Um, with emulsion going through it. Um, here is the analogy with carbon dioxide. Okay, so here's a drill. And this is a drill with no oil. And it is a $200 drill. When we ran this test, I literally ducked because the drill is not supposed to be able to drill a long, narrow, deep, accurate hole in titanium without oil or water. This is supposed to be impossible, but it worked. <laughs> and it's actually going faster than that drill would go with water. It's bananas what is going on here. And we are bringing the carbon dioxide just, in the, just as we would in the example of a through tool coolant right, where the, 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 um, the emulsion was going through the drill and coming out the tip, same deal here. Um, so the example is down here in the lower right, you can see that the, um, the cutting fluid based on carbon dioxide, it's actually a special form of carbon dioxide, which is called supercritical carbon dioxide. Um, you know, and that sounds like a fancy word, but it's just like another state of matter, solid, liquid, gas, supercritical. This is a thing that scientists have known for hundreds of years about supercritical fluids. Um, I had the idea to use supercritical carbon dioxide instead of liquid carbon dioxide as a cutting fluid. It turned out it was a really good idea. Um, it really shocked me how well it worked. And so we apply the cutting fluid in exactly the same way 
as we do the emulsion. We can bring it through the drill or we can bring it from outside. In this uh, example here on the upper right, um, you know, we're actually bringing it through the tool holder. Or we could actually also have external nozzles um, if we wanted to. And let me see if I have a picture of that. I should have a picture of that. Do I not have a picture of that? Oh, I seriously don't have a picture of that. Um, oh, kind of, kind of. Okay, let me let me use this picture here. So, um, you know, you see these plastic nozzles here. You can run water through them. You can also run external nozzles of supercritical CO2. Or as you kind of see in the example here, um, there is, maybe as the tool's changing, you can see that um, it's going through the holder, actually, not through the tool. So there's lots of ways to deliver cutting fluid, and either externally or through the holder for the, the tool or through the tool itself. So just the same way as emulsion, um, you know, we can replace the emulsion with supercritical CO2. Now, why can we just treat carbon dioxide, which is a gas, as if it's a liquid. And there's a, there's a reason for that. And that is because there is what is called supercritical carbon dioxide. It's not a liquid, it's not a solid, it's not a gas, it's a supercritical uh, fluid. And what it means is in the supercritical state, if you pressurize carbon dioxide to 1,100 pounds per square inch and heat it to just above room temperature, um, 88 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, carbon dioxide becomes weird. It is, it's a lot like a liquid. In fact, it, it has the density of a liquid, like the, the density of supercritical CO2 is about 80% of water. So you can pump it, you can do, you can pressurize it and all that. And 1100 PSI, that might seem like a lot of pressure, but emulsion uses high pressure, same pressure. Like we can do that in a factory, no problem. That's just a pump, no big deal. So I want to present to you the magic weirdness of supercritical carbon dioxide which I happened to learn about one day, just like you're learning about it today. And I'm like, oh, that's a cutting fluid. Um, so uh, let me show you what happens. This is a pretty cool video. When I go from a liquid carbon dioxide, this is just pressurized liquid carbon dioxide. And what you see here is the, the it could be a little hard to see. This is a, um, this sort of bright blue down here, that's liquid carbon dioxide. So this is carbon dioxide pressurized to 1,000 PSI. So it's not in the supercritical state, but it's just under it. And this is a drop of lubricant, just a small drop. It looks like a big drop, but it's a small drop. And just like oil and water, oil doesn't mix in liquid carbon dioxide. So it's just floating here at the surface. So what we did here was, um, oh, you can see here. First, this is no oil, just going from liquid carbon dioxide to supercritical carbon dioxide. You can see it has density like a liquid, but now it's filling the container like a gas. So it has mobility like a gas, density like a liquid, and it dissolves stuff like a liquid. So now, like we're gonna add a drop of oil. We needed to use a blue light here so you could see the oil. And look what happens. The liquid CO2 is gonna fill the container, now it's supercritical, and it dissolved the oil. So with one tiny little drop of oil, we can provide lubrication when we need it. In the hip cup case, we didn't need it. Some other cases, we do need it. And so we bring that lubrication in, and now we can do things which you could never imagine doing before, right? Now the question is, oh, I get it you are cooling and lubricating at the same time because I'm, ex I'm expanding. I'm not sure I understand. Sorry, uh, um, and my watch just is talking to me. But um, you know, as that carbon dioxide expands, it not only lubricates, it provides 
um, cooling, right? And even when you don't add the oil for complicated reasons, it actually lubricates. So, um, you know, you can, you can put it through a, what's called a mill, um, which is used to kind of um, like side cut or slot material. You can use it to drill holes. You can you know, think of a baseball bat. When you turn that, you're changing the diameter of the material. You can, you can turn it down. Now, the question in the, um, in the uh, uh, chat that some of you may not be able to see is, um, you know, does the material um, get too cold? I, that's how I interpret it. And the answer is no. Um, it's metal. You need a lot more cooling than this to do that. But actually, we're generating heat in the process. And we're not actually making the part cold. Um, you saw some frost on the, on the surface. But the material itself, it's not like changing dimension or anything like that. Um, it's more of a visual effect than it is actually the part becoming brittle or cold. And that was actually a, a real concern that I had initially when we were testing the technology. But it's not a real uh, concern. What happens to the carbon dioxide? We could recover it. We could reuse it. But it's not a, a, a solution that the market will adopt because there's a lot of waste carbon dioxide out there and it's really cheap to use. And if I put a machine in my facility, which I have designed, I know how to do that, um, but it's literally a $2 million machine and the payback on that is basically never. Um, it's so expensive to do that. So I'll keep buying uh, recycled CO2. But remember that the CO2 I'm using is recycled CO2. What it means is you go to the fertilizer plant um, and you take the carbon dioxide or the ethanol plant and that's emitting carbon dioxide, you capture the CO2 and reuse it before it goes back to the atmosphere. Okay? And you can ask whether that's greenwashing. I think it's a good question. But it, the way that we use the technology, it is going to the atmosphere. It is going to the place where it was destined. Okay? Um, let me give a couple more examples here. Um, we're going to be running short on time um, just because it's fun. Um, this is um, an example of titanium um, being used for an, like an aircraft application. Um, and in this application, we can drill holes full, four times faster than emulsion can do it. You can see that drill is going really fast. The holes are better. They have better surface quality and the tool lasts um, four times longer. Now, I mentioned before that people have been trying to use carbon dioxide for 50 years. They've tried other gases too, and so have I. Argon, xenon, nitrogen, liquid nitrogen, liquid CO2, um, dry machining. Like, people have tried everything. But it turned out that secret sauce in using a supercritical fluid, that made all the difference. And it turned out like, like a lot of materials in their supercritical state are corrosive, that you can't handle them, like supercritical water, like it doesn't work. Like um, basically, if you want this level of performance, attractive performance. Now remember, like people need a reason to adopt your solution, right? And remember, this solution does eliminate health hazards. It does eliminate water pollution. Right. And I've got examples like all day long, like really fun videos like of um, uh, let me show you this milling example. I love this one. Like literally um, like we're cutting through like this hardened aluminum like it's butter. Like this is just like people who machine aluminum all day. Like you're doing a slot that fast. There's no tool wear. Like what? This is crazy. And you can see like there's some frost at the top of the tool, but at the bottom there isn't because that's where the heat is, right? So yeah, I think you're getting the idea. This is, um, this, this works, okay? Um, and I want to show you that, um, you know, well, look, people have tried lots of other things. They've tried liquid nitrogen, liquid CO2, emulsion, and, you know, pure cut like works so well, they just stop the test, like, 
All right, we're guiding titanium for two hours and you know everything else failed quickly. Like, okay, this is really good. Now, um, yeah, there isn't another solution that works this well. There just isn't. So at least that I've found, and I've been working in cutting fluids for 30 years and I've, I've tried a lot of things. Let's get to the greenwashing. So the, you know, we're at a carbon conference here, so let's look at carbon conference. So there are stocks of carbon dioxide under the ground and the oil and gas industry uses them. If you take carbon dioxide from a well underground and use it as a cutting fluid, you're evil. And, um, you know, thankfully, like we don't have to do that, but it turns out that would be um, a really bad idea to take sequestered carbon and put it in the atmosphere. Now, when you use recycled carbon dioxide, it turns out that the carbon footprint of doing that is small. But the real benefit is that you eliminate the need for like really clean water and you make your tools last longer. And in doing that, and you actually reduce the energy of the machine tool, like that actually removes carbon on a life cycle basis. So your better operations, your more efficient tool wear, like that actually is a huge win because these tools have these really exotic, like this one, like this is titanium nitride coating on carbide. Um, it costs $400 for a reason. It's crazy if you look at the environmental footprint of this material, and now you're gonna make that last four times longer. Like that's the benefit from a carbon perspective. Plus the, um, the uh, uh, health hazards, obviously, and the um, uh, elimination of water pollution. So, you know, on a number of, this is, so if, if you go to college and you learn about life cycle assessment, maybe you go to Michigan, uh, you take a, a sustainability course with me, um, you know, you're going to learn how to express environmental impacts in, in sort of standard ways. And this is a standard way. Now, it might look like madness to you, but I'll end with this plot. Supercritical carbon dioxide is blue. High pressure emulsion is um, orange. So that's sort of the state of the art. Uh, low pressure is the dot, low pressure emulsion. Uh, green is liquid nitrogen. Okay, so this is the comparison, four comparisons here. And you see if it's global warming potential, it's lower. Ozone depletion potential is lower. Smog forming potential is lower. Acidification potential is lower. Respiratory impacts, pretty similar to respiratory, maybe a little lower. Ecotoxicity, similar, maybe a little lower. Energy consumption, similar, maybe higher, but probably a lot lower. All right, water consumption goes down a lot, okay, on a life cycle basis. So coming back to, this will be the last slide, the criteria, I think I can make an argument for a sustainable solution here and one that the market is adopting. We've got a company of 20 people over in Canton, Michigan doing this. Uh, this has been adopted in the automotive industry, in the aerospace industry, in the biomedical industry, and we're trying to stand up a Michigan business doing this. And I think I can make an argument for sustainability based on the criteria. But always, that is up to you. I hope you've gotten something out of the presentation today. It's been a real pleasure uh, to share um, you know, some, some of the case studies that we've developed and thinking. Um, and I, again, I thank you for taking time out of your Saturday and I wish you well for the rest of the conference. Thanks again.